Hey folks, this is Tim and this is a rehearsal for my TED talk uh, where we will speak about the reason why I think that creative coding is a tool for digital empowerment. Let's get started. So um, I would like to speak about the digitization in the last 30 years. So especially in the beginning, especially about the time between 1985 and 2000. Because my father, Hans, on this photo he's 35, had a graphic design company. Right? He founded it in 1985 and this was the desk, how it looked like. So this was how he just started uh, in his home office. And if you take a look at the desk, you will see that there's no computer on it. So he was working with scissors and glue and pencil, paper, ink, brushes. So that was basically his tool set. Everything went very, very slow. So to make layouts, that was really a lot of work. Just a few years later, they implemented uh, computers into the company. Again, this is the photo of my father. What you see here on the bottom right of the photo is a Apple Macintosh. So the Apple Macintosh basically revolutionized how graphic design was made at that time. So it just accelerated the whole process of creating layouts and graphic design products uh, so fundamentally. Computers or the Apple Macintosh at the time was used to create layouts, to create illustrations, uh, later on to edit images and that was crazy that basically combined all the things that were necessary and that needed a lot of manpower uh, in one very simple machine and that was the most fundamental transformative change in the history of my father's company that's a floppy disk this floppy disk is capable of saving one megabyte one megabyte that's one small photo from uh, taken from your smartphone, right? One megabyte, imagine that. Just a few years later, these uh, disks came to the market or were the standard for saving data. So that disk is a 3.5 inch disk and it is capable of saving 3.25 megabytes. That's an increase of more than 200%. <laughs> it's, it's crazy, just a few years later. And if we take a look at uh, 1997 or 1998, we had CD burners in the company of my father. The CD burner was capable of saving 650 megabytes to a CD-ROM. And that's about 200 3.5 inch disks. <laughs> that's crazy, right? So this is the exponential growth of um, data storage capacities. What also happened in the 90s is that the internet became commercially usable. People started to create websites. Um, this is how they looked back in the days. Very simple, very rudimentary. Uh, and email also revolutionized the whole uh, market because it didn't have to go to a post office to send some printing data. Uh, it was super easy to just send that data via an email. Mobile phones started to become standard. Everyone had a mobile phone. When I was 16, that was the coolest phone uh, that he could have, a Nokia 3210. Imagine it was, it was possible to take that device and call your friends from anywhere in the city. You had this thing in your pocket. And I, I know that it is hard to imagine, but at that time that was a revolution. Everyone wanted to have a Nokia 3210. I didn't have one, um, but yeah, you know, that was great design at the time. It was able to send SMS messages, to make phone calls, and there was this amazing snake game on it. Revolutionary. So again, let's take a look at the technological um, evolution uh, in, in the firm of my father. So he started completely analog. The Apple Macintosh changed everything. And then, you know, the capacities of data storage just increased exponentially. And the internet, internet came to the, into the whole business. So the profession of my father or the profession of the graphic designer was at one side, it was simplified very much. It felt like simplification. It felt like uh, growth and that um, the whole profession becomes much better through computers. But at the same time, it led to an uh, increasing acceleration of the whole business. The uh, competition also adapted all these technologies. So everything became much faster, much, much more accelerated and yeah. So what I want to say here is that the implementation of new technologies didn't just make your life better, but it made the whole world much faster. Let's take a look at what kind of situation we have today, 2021, and let's talk about the pros and cons of modern technologies. It's very important to understand that the economy drives innovation, right? So the economy 
is basically the factor that decides what kind of technologies that we integrate into our uh, daily life and into our world. And it's not really the question what we need, but what sells best. And innovation is not really always equal to progress. So there can be innovations that we adapt that don't really have um, more advantages than disadvantages. And that's very important. That's something we often don't really question. Because innovation and especially digitization has expensive collateral damage that is not really um, thematized by, by the marketing campaigns of the companies that sell us their products. So the reflection of how technologies affect our world um, is very, very important. Let's take a look at social media, for example. Social media is great, right? We use it every day. We, we just it connects people all around the planet. It's possible to communicate with people around specific topics. It's just amazing. And I love that. It's, it's great. But at the same time, it has some very difficult to tackle. It causes some difficult to tackle problems like, you know, addiction and crazy um, shift in the personalities of people who are addicted to social media. It leads to narcissism and a lot of social stress and also to disconnection because if we people just communicate via social media, we don't really connect intimate with people in real life and that's a big problem. Uh, it also leads to political instabilities because if we have strange or wrong political um, assumptions, if we are in an echo chamber of social media, we only get positive feedback on these assumptions and that's a huge problem. I mean, I don't can cover the whole thing here. It's, it's just a very small piece of the whole perspective, but I think it's very important to look at it. And also through social media, we have these monopoles. So social media companies are mostly um, located in North America and they control how people communicate with each other. And they design algorithms that are addictive and um, cause damages in our psychological system, which is crazy, right? So they want us to be addicted from their products. And that's something I find extremely questionable. Let's talk about smartphones. Smartphones are great, right? They, they, it's amazing how these little computers help us in our everyday life. So they are our, our navigation systems. They connect us with people through video conferencing. We have them, we use them as a bank office, as a video production center, as our music collection. We watch videos on them. Um, we organize our business life. We read newspapers on them. So it's, it's really amazing what kind of uh, devices we have in our pockets. But at the same time, it's also very, very important to look at the collateral damage onto the bad sides of smartphones. So they lead to stress, just like social media. They uh, disconnect us when we use them for communication. They disconnect us from, from people in real life. Um, they, well, they led to exploitation of workers in Asian factories. They lead to um, cr crazy environmental damage. And of course, to the loss of intimacy when we speak about um, personal and human relationships. And now we have COVID. We never had an accelerator of that scale for digitization, never. So COVID just made everything digital. We shifted the whole educational world into the digital, and we also shifted the whole world of work into the digital, which is crazy. So today we don't know what kind of consequences this will have. So I already see that it cannot be good for children to, to I mean, this can't be a solution for our ed educational system because if, if children only speak with computer screens, that's not really what life is about from my perspective. I mean, it's great. We don't have to fly to, I don't know, to Munich or Berlin or Paris or wherever to speak to a team. That's amazing. We can take video conferencing, but at the same time, it's very dangerous to assume that it makes sense to shift everything into the digital just uncritically. I think you get the point. So what I want to say here is that digital technologies always have advantages and disadvantages. And we often look too much at the advantages because the marketing messages, that's what they show us, right? So we don't think enough about the disadvantages of technologies and innovation. And I think this is something that is more important for the future because AI is just around the corner and will confront us with enormously difficult ethical questions. So 
Digitization is just a very disruptive transformational process. And it's, it's going exponentially. And um, it's our job to question digitization and to really find the good solutions, separate them from the bad solutions without being too tempted from marketing messages and just adapting all the new products uncritically. That's what really drives me and what I find extremely important. There's an amazing quote by John Maeda. He's one of the co-founders or basically one of the four thinkers of processing, which is something I'm going to speak about in a minute. And he said in his book, How to Speak Machine, computation is made by us and we are all collectively now responsible for its outcomes. We have to think about how computation affects our world. If we don't do that, we rely on companies that just want to earn money and want to get more rich and powerful uh, to, to, to solve philosophical questions. And that's what's not possible. I'm just one, one little light on this planet where I, I'm just Tim <laughs> and I can change the whole game. But still the question for me since many years is what can I do? How can I contribute something for a positive uh, development in that cosmos of problems? And that's what I'm thinking about since a very long time. And that's the reason why I went back, even though I was already teaching creative coding for graphic designers since many years. Um, I've been, when I went back to university and studied digital media and experiment in Bielefeld to think deeply about the why and the philosophy of creative coding and what I teach. Through my research, I came in touch with a book called Code at Art by Jochen Viehoff and Georg Togemann. And that was really a game changer in my perspective on uh, programming, coding and the whole situation. So the subtitle of this book is Programming as an Artistic Practice and it calls to understand programming as an elementary cultural technique. So to put it in one line with reading, writing and math. That way, programming can become our tool for digital empowerment, our tool to demystify the seemingly overpowerful technologies that we use every day. The problem is that coding and programming has a very bad reputation. So people think about it as something very abstract, something very complicated, something very difficult to learn. And I believe deeply that we have to cultivate programming anew and free it from the cliche of culturelessness. That's also something that I found in this book, right? Um, looking at programming as an artistic tool, a valuable artistic tool that helps us to depict and question digital phenomena. So the question is, how can we bring this new approach into the world? So it's already happening. <laughs> I mean, creative coding, which basically means programming with an artistic practice, is not really new. It already exists uh, since quite a long time, since the 50s or 60s of the last century. This term, creative coding, is quite new and a programming language called processing really contributed a large part to coin this term and make this very, very popular. So processing has been released 2001 and it was developed specifically for artists and designers. So this is how it looks like, right? It's a very simple code editor. There's um, some code you can put in there to describe a visual. And if you hit the run button at the top left, the visual will be um, displayed in a in a window. So it's very, very easy. Look at this. I mean, these are just eight lines of code and it already displays an interactive application. Years before, it was very, very difficult to display something like this with programming because you had to write a lot of code only to access the mouse or display and rectangle, for example. It teaches you the very basic principles of programming and at the same time, it hides a lot of complexity, that stuff that just happens under the hood. It makes just programming, artistic programming, very simple. And it's free and open source. That means everyone in the world can download it for free, use it, and you don't have to pay for it. But the most powerful thing about processing is its community, which is totally open, very friendly, and um, super diverse worldwide connected people from all genders people from all countries in the world use processing connect via the internet there are amazing conferences and meetups groups forums hackathons festivals so this is a very vivid community of people who contribute through their time and effort to develop a system and a connection and network of people worldwide that love to question technologies in an artistic way
Well, the status quo of creative coding in art in design education is very difficult. So mostly my courses are perceived as an optional extension to an more or less old fashioned and static curriculum. And I dream of an university on an, of an educational institution that takes creative coding and puts it into the very, very core of the curriculum, because only that way the real power of creative coding come to life, because it takes a little bit of time to overstep the very first um, obstacles in the learning process. It takes a few semesters to really get your head around, around the potentials and the possibilities with creative coding. So one semester is very much work. It's very difficult to get on board. Uh, still, even if processing already simplified the whole process of learning to code. But um, yeah, only if you cross that specific threshold, you are able to experience and see the sacred land of possibilities of creative coding. And that's why I find it super important to think of creative coding as a fundamental building block in design education that has its place in the very core of the curriculum. Okay, let's wrap this up. Digitization is an exponential pro process. We are inside of an historic evolution of technical progress that has never been there in that, at that scale. So we have never been living in times where um, technical innovations fundamentally change our lives and the world of, world of work in such a rapid pace. And that's something that we really should be aware of. We need to question digital innovation and technological innovation deeply. And as artists and designers, we have the power to create artifacts and artworks that depict and question the digital, depict and question technological innovation. That's very, very important. That's what the world needs. And that's what I'm fighting for as an educator. I empower young creatives for an increasingly digitized and technologized world. That's why I'm here today. Thank you very much.